You know, when I was a child, um, there was no such thing as a thought of going to the Olympics. My normal life was, you know, either living on the streets, eating out of garbage cans, you know, watching people do drugs, watching my mom do drugs. And so back then there was the only thought of anything was how do I survive every single day? I was definitely the, the kid that uh, everybody said that, you know, if you make it to the age of 16, we'll be surprised. I feel 100% confident saying that sports saved my life. If you were going to raise a child the wrong way, you could just follow exactly what they did. They did, you know, everything you could do wrong to a kid was done to him. It's almost too much to believe that somebody had gone through that and come out of it as well as he had. He was only probably 16, 17 year old boy and you could see, wow, this kid is really something special. Without sport in his life, I don't think he would have made it out of high school. He would have been on the streets. This is where I grew up. This is my roots, if you will. I can relate to seeing that kid just like me as a young boy. Most kids are playing games and videos and running around the neighborhood. And you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a room or on the streets watching my parents shoot up drugs. Um, and sometimes something that would happen where, you know, my mom overdosed on drugs. It was pretty desperate in that he learned to be very resilient living on the street. There were times that he would uh, dig through the trash cans to find food. He didn't really even know how to go to school. I mean, you're talking about basics here that most kids grow up with from the time they start at four or five. I know it wasn't a traditional childhood, but it's what we had, and we embraced it. And in a world where our mother was taken away, we don't know who her father is, or my father's in prison, we had each other. always a constant thing where something happened and I was either taken away, um, going to a foster home or trying to stay with my grandma for a little bit of time. There were many, many, many foster homes. And it was at a time, at about 12, when they could not keep him in a foster home. Uh, he would just run away. One evening late, he called me. He was scared. I could sense it. So. I went to pick him up. As I can remember, I mean, like, if he needed me, I mean, I would take him home with me. My grandma played a, a very, very important role. Can never be satisfied with only a thank you. You know, she provided unconditional love to a grandson that was not her responsibility. Hey, grandma. Back when I was a young boy and I was very undisciplined and very crazy and didn't want to listen to anybody. And my grandma stepped in several different times uh, trying to provide some type of normalcy uh, in my life. I watered this morning, so you don't need that much. It wasn't easy because I, I raised three of my own without a husband. And then uh, when Billy and, and his sister came into my life, I, I did my best and I taught him to do right, what's wrong and what's right. My grandma believed in me before I believed in me. Um, and so she always, you know, I reflect back now and I look back at all the things that she did. Um, cleaning the house every Saturday. 
making us clean the house every Saturday and making sure it was clean and taken care of, cleaning, taking care of the yard, pulling weeds, and train hard and do the right things and not go out and get in trouble and, and hang out and party. Um, and it was all those little things that she did. And, and maybe she didn't even realize it then, but they were I, important I, to no. me. It's something that you t teach your kids, you know. Uh, it, you're not aware of it, but you know, you want them to, to do things good. And I hope he's still doing it. Yeah. Clean house. <laughs> <laughs> We were together in eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh, twelfth, then in college also. So our, I think our relationship kind of just went and grew as we as we grew older. The one person I, I noticed right away was a kid named Jake Schultz. He was clean looking, cut kid. Everyone liked him, and he was doing all the different events. You know, he was doing the sprints and the high jump and hurdles and all these events. And I, I noticed that everyone was really attracted to him just naturally. That's who I wanted to be like. Oh, what's up, dude? How you doing? He was different. He was a little out of control. Funny. The kids loved to watch what he would uh, do to the teachers. Um, I just remember him just kind of being a little out of control in that first period class. You know, I was the only colored kid there and I had this big afro and raggedy clothes. <laughs> I remember, I remember seventh grade, yeah. first period, general music. <laughs> and Miss Smith, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Smith, you were climbing on the desk. Yeah. <laughs> you and like, Philip White. Everybody was like, oh my gosh, yeah. who is this kid? In seventh grade, it was like the second day of track practice, and he was mouthing off to the coach, and the coach kicked him off the team. So seventh grade, he got kicked off the track team. <laughs> I thought that was a really important time, because a lot of kids would have used that as their justification to act out, but he didn't. He went through school another year and then tried out again, when he made the teams. As we grew, the, the focus started to narrow and he started to feel that he, was, he could do something great. It was a perfect fit for me. Um, it gave me an opportunity to finally find something that I could be passionate about and start setting goals and just enjoy doing. And, and, and basically taking like what I was good at as a straight kid and putting it to something that's more positive and beneficial in, in sports. I was covering a high school track meet. It was probably 1989, and he was, I believe, a junior in high school that year. And uh, he was named the outstanding athlete of the track meet. He won three or four events, and his team won the team championship. I kind of made a connection with him that day and kind of followed his career ever since then. He needed to have something else in his life. You know, in sports, satisfied that desire, I guess. I recruited him out of the high school and it was mostly phone calls and we have him come up and visit the campus and then once he decided to come to Weber State, that's when I started coaching him in this jumping and throwing events. He was the first person that I had ever coached that when I gave him an instruction, something he needed to change, he did it. And it blew me away that one verbal indication of something I want to change, he would get it. Great athletes pick things up quickly, and that he, he was faster than anybody I had ever dealt with. Those of us that grew up in a two-parent home are used to having things fairly easy, and nothing was easy for him, and I think being used to the difficulties made it so that he was willing to just work and work and work until he perfected his various disciplines. He was uh, the best junior mark in the decathlon in the world that year. 
7,500 points. He was a good hurdler, he was a good long jumper, he was good at high jump, javelin. So it was pretty obvious early on that he was going to be a multi-event person, a decathlete. The year of the 2000 Sydney Games was probably the best uh, year athletically for me in track and field. I was one of the top, top three Americans going into the uh, USA Track and Field Championships Olympic Trials. And in the second event of the decathlon, which is a long jump, uh, it happened to be raining that day. My heel slid on the track and twisted my ankle to the point where it was almost like I couldn't walk on it. So I, I got my things and told my coach I was done and, and um, you know, walked off the track and I, and I gave up. And um, you know, for me, that was a lifelong you know, work and effort and overcoming so many obstacles in my life, you know, tragedies and you know, family stuff and friends and uh, injuries and, and just so many hurdles in my life that for it all to end like that was just a tragedy for me. It was uh, a difficult thing for him, I know. It's an amazing story to me that he still managed to be in that place where the opportunity came up then to meet someone that was competing in a completely different world and move on from there. They you know, told me like, oh, there's this sport called bobsled and it would be a perfect fit for you. You're athletic, you're fast, you're powerful, you're explosive. I mean, obviously football players and track guys are gonna bring a lot of power and speed. So that's a natural for an event like the bobsled. In a sport with hundreds of seconds, you know, one hit, one body position in the wrong place can slow you down. The pushers, I mean, it's our job to propel that sled from zero to as fast as possible. The driver, he's gonna guide the sled down, down the track. Once we're in, you know, the driver guides, we get as low as possible and try to mesh with the sled, try to blend with the curves. His hip muscles, his leg muscles, his shoulder muscles, those were really playing into him being able to, to push the sled. And he was a great worker in the weight room. And so he could focus more on the lifts and building the strength where he needed it to only push. At the time, the Winter Olympics here in Salt Lake City, it was only a year and three months away. So what I, what I started doing is, you know, everything and all my focus that I put into track and field and to make the Sydney Olympic Games, and it's now going to be a, an a Olympian in the sport of bobsled. We have, what, 20 or so athletes, you know, several different sleds trying to vie for a spot on the Olympic team. Um, Bill was on one of the other sleds. We knew he was a good athlete, but he just weren't, he wasn't a member of our team. Randy Jones was the man. I'll be honest, it was a little intimidating because not only was he the man, but he was on the team. When we had to pick another member, we had a choice of about three athletes to choose from, and we all said Bill would probably be the best for our team. My whole life dreams of being an Olympian um, are like all starting to come to fruition. So having that opportunity to possibly punch my ticket to the Olympic Games was unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the opening ceremony of the 19th Olympic Winter Games. Olympics, it's, oh geez, it's such a huge event. You just feel this energy that you cannot get from anywhere else. Pressure was astronomical. I mean, it, I think it was harder to compete at home because of the pressure of winning at home. Back then, uh, the U.S. United States had not won a medal in bobsledding for 40 or 50 years or something. It had been a long, long time. USA and Germany were the top two ranked sleds in the world, and so it could have gone to either team. After the first day, we were in first place. As expected, we're, I think it was tougher to be in first place after the first day because you know you have two more heats. 
That first run of the second day, we fell back um, quite a bit. You know, if we have another run like that, we might not win a medal at all. Now the last heat, it starts snowing. The snow is filling up the track, which of course is gonna slow down the track. So the teams who go off earlier, they have faster time. This is an opportunity you have to make a huge difference and you've got one shot to make it happen. And we just went out there and I, you know, I remember hearing all the chants of USA. It was so loud, um, you know, walking out there, but as soon as I stepped on the ice, it was quiet. It was just a dead silence. Boom, we start. Explosion right out of the blocks. Um, great start, we all load, the load goes really well. You can feel the ride, like you can tell each bump, each curve. I mean, you know when it's good, you know when it's bad. And the ride was, you know, was almost perfect. And, you know, we get done and we felt like we had a good ride and you can't see what's going on yet and all of a sudden you see the time go up and boom, you know, f at that point in time we were in first place and so that guaranteed us at least an Olympic medal. I came up, saw that one, I think it was a picture in one of the newspapers. You can just see me with my hands up like, yes, I finally did it. We finally did it. You know, that it has been done. I'm happy I was there because I live his dream. When I saw him up there and doing all that, I lived his dream. I, I mean, we're not supposed to do that as journalists. We're supposed to stay very neutral and say nice job. But I was, I was so happy when he got that medal, I couldn't help but just kind of give him a hug and say congratulations. Team USA. So when he was up on that stage winning the silver medal, I was in the state penitentiary. I remember looking up on that screen and seeing my handsome little brother and thinking, it's like having a part of me free. I was thinking at that time when he was up there, when he was a, a little boy, when he was going to school, all that came to my mind. So all that is in my heart. The feeling of such satisfaction, overwhelmed with joy and happiness, is, is the best way I could possibly describe that. It's, it's always been an interesting thing. I've never been able to perfectly describe what that moment feels like to anybody because it's a feeling that you only get maybe once in a lifetime, if ever. So many people are like, you finally made it, you're done. I said, no, my coach always taught me that any fool could do it once. And so, you know, I pursued doing another Olympics. You know, with that always comes more sacrifice because again, that's more time away from family. And, um, you know, both times with, with both my kids, um, you know, I was gone in competition and had to fly back for my daughter from uh, Europe to be there when she was born. And I uh, was there for a week, and then I left for four months. Same thing with my, my son. I was in Canada and came home when he was born and um, left for five, six months. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great to say that, you know, I accomplished so much, and, and which I did, um, but also, you know, there's a lot of the sacrifices that come along with that, and relationships are one of them. Everything you do, there's always a price to pay, and for everyone, I think it's different. 
You know, some people might say that it was too big of a price to pay. Um, for me, there, there was not a problem. I would have paid any price to would have paid any price to make it to the Olympic Games because um, it changed my life forever. When I retired, started spending more time with my family. It was, it was a brand new process. It was like learning who these people were all over again and building that relationship and them getting to know me on, on a different level. This morning I'm heading out to Phoenix, Arizona uh, to go and visit my mom. And she has lived there for about 14 years so I don't get a lot of opportunities to come visit her. Honestly, this is probably the first opportunity we've had to talk on a normal basis um, and talk about our story together. It's gonna to be a very special day, very special, um, it's gonna be a very special emotional day. chose a path of living a crazy life with, you know, drugs and um, homelessness and prostitution and all these other different things. And it, unfortunately, it, you know, it takes a lot of people down the wrong path. It's the only picture I have, the one and only. Um, I don't have any other pictures of my mom and I together, and it's very special because I have no pictures also from when I was a baby. Um, and so I've always had this picture with me, and I always keep it close. Thank you. Hello, how are you? Good, you are? I'm Liliana. Liliana, finally, nice, nice yeah, to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you gonna see your mom? I gonna see my mom. Sure, she's so excited <laughs> to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see you. <laughs> I haven't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> your hair's so short. I know, they chopped <laughs> chopped it off. I've never seen your hair I short. I know, but I'm gonna have it. I'm gonna let it grow now. <laughs> God, you look so beautiful. <laughs> Handsome as well, ever. I'm so happy to see you. Yeah, me too. I've, I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> I mean, every day I just keep saying, well, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna act? You know, they just said, just be yourself, though. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I'm just so happy to see you. I know. You. It's it's, we're here. We're here and you're finally we're here. Yeah. And then I have also my Olympic silver medal from the Olympics. Oh, wow. Look, Pat. See his medal? <laughs> God, it's heavy. I know, huh? Could you wear that around your neck? For a very short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm down and out, I can come out here and think about things, yeah. you know, try to remember things that I used to do and what I used to do with my kids. And, you know, and I hope and pray that my kids have learned to forgive me because that's very important to me. And well, I've told you. Yeah. You know, you know, you say sorry all the time and you don't need to. You know, if if you need to hear me say that I forgive you, um, I'll say I forgive you, but there's nothing that you need to be forgiven for. Thank you. I just want to tell you how proud I am of you. You are? I'm glad. You're still here. 
Oh yeah, I'm not gonna go nowhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I said, it's just nice to see that you're safe and, and healthy. And you know? happy. And happy. I'm very happy here. And you're surrounded by people that are loving and caring. Yeah, they are. We have very good caretakers, caregivers. <laughs> but I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. I'm so very proud. Like, you know, you're a bad person, you're a troublemaker, and you're never going to amount to anything. And so for me to go from that to, you know, the Olympic Games, not only once, but three times, win an Olympic medal, you know, that was against all odds. Congratulations. <laughs> At the end of it all, instead of acting like the victim and being bitter and mean and tough, and he's a nice guy. Why did you get so fast? How did you become so fast? I mean, maybe he was running from something, running to something. As time goes by and you see what this little boy became, then you say, I did a good job. I'm very proud of Bill. I think that what he's accomplished, it helps everyone. There's no big prize at the end of that trail, you know, for most Olympians. There's not a multi-million dollar contract. What motivated me was getting away from that lifestyle, and I wanted my kids to be able to look up to their dad and, and say, oh, you know, my dad actually did something special.